Okay, uh, I think it's coming up on five past, so we still have people coming in, but we're going to get started. So first off, uh, to outline a little bit about the research. So between 2019 and 2021, the abortion rights campaign developed and conducted an extensive research project to evaluate people's experiences of violence, abortion services. We knew that the legislation that was passed in 2018 contained barriers that would prevent abortion from being free, safe, legal, and local in Ireland. But we wanted to understand the impact of those barriers from the perspective of the women and pregnant people who needed care. We wanted to know what it was like to access abortion in Ireland without the Eighth Amendment. And with the upcoming legislative review, we wanted to make sure that the voices of those who had access or indeed had failed to access abortion were being heard. And what we've learned is that where services are working, they're working well for the most part, but there are still massive gaps in service provision and far too many barriers to safe abortion access. So our speakers today are Dr. Lorraine Grimes, a postdoctoral researcher at Maynooth University and the primary data analyst on our project. We're also pleased to be joined by Mary Favia from Doctors for Choice, Maureen Enright from Lawyers for Choice, and Mara Clark from the Abortion Support Network. So I'm now gonna hand you over to Dr. Lorraine Grimes, who was the primary data analyst on the project to go through the main findings of the research. Lorraine is a postdoctoral researcher in the Social Sciences Institute at Maynooth University on the project Digital Preservation of Reproductive Health Resources, archiving the eighth. She also worked on the World Health Organization project, Reproductive Health, the implementation of abortion policy in Ireland, and has a number of forthcoming publications focusing on unmarried motherhood, maternity care, and stillbirth in Britain and Ireland. So Lorraine. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Helen. I'll just share my screen now. And so first of all, I just want to say that it's an absolute pleasure to present this data today. And it's been a pleasure to work with ARC um, on this over the last few months. Um, so I'll just very briefly go through some of the main findings in the report. And the findings came from a survey which include qualitative and quantitative data. There was 402 respondents altogether. There was a low completion rate of 9%. Uh, but the survey was translated into 11 languages and there was five languages answered in Arabic, Irish, Polish and of course English. Um, ARC made significant efforts to try and get a diverse representation of participants, but as you might expect, the majority of respondents identified as female, white Irish and 35 years of age or over. The majority of respondents had an abortion at the GP surgery in a women's health clinic or in the hospital. 30 had an abortion outside of Ireland. 21 tried to have an abortion but re was refused care or couldn't obtain pills and 12 had an abortion by importing pills or accessing an abortion in some other way. So just over half of respondents, 54.04% did not know where to go to get an abortion. Participants did not know to contact my options in order to access an abortion. The majority of respondents said that they Googled or looked on the internet to find information. And 7.64% or 12 participants said that they encountered a rogue organization. One participant said, I went to get a pregnancy test and to look at options, but they only tried to talk me out of an abortion and towards adoption. In addition, participants felt that they were not properly informed on the level of pain with an early medical abortion. One participant said, I wasn't expecting the level of pain I experienced. And I was alone in my house, which was scary at times. So that's something I think that um, that we can work on in, in the future moving forward. So the experience of my options overall is quite mixed. Uh, Councillors were described as supportive and non-judgmental. One participant said, I chatted with my options twice and I can't commend them enough for their empathic approach. They went above and beyond to make me aware of my options in a non-judgmental way. However, some noted counsellors being rude or cold. One participant said, the lady I got, I felt was a bit cold. It put me off ringing again. 
In addition, the helpline is not available 24 seven for information services. There is a 24 hour helpline and um, that's for medical assistance only. One participant said, at first I left a message, no one called me back. After two days, I rang again and got an answer. So there was difficulties in actually accessing the helpline. So there was a number of delays experienced and there are more throughout the report, but the mandatory three day wait did negatively impact patients' health and well-being. And there's many examples of this throughout the report. So one participant said, it made me feel like I was not trusted to make my own decision and caused me a great deal of mental and physical distress. Some participants noted a long wait in order to get an appointment with their GP. One respondent had to wait for two weeks. Another was told she would have to wait for three weeks. After having a scan, 52.83% of participants waited over three days before having the abortion. One participant said, I could have waited for a public ultrasound, but the wait was unknown. At every stage, I felt I was delayed by one to two days. Time between the first appointment and second appointment, between doctor, ultrasound and referral, it just kept stretching. I was nervous that I would be out of eligibility if there were any more delays. I don't know what I would have done then. So in terms of travel for care, respondents typically traveled up to one hour to access abortion services in Ireland. A number of respondents spoke of cramping while they were driving on the way home and a reliance on public transport left people in difficult situations while waiting for a bus in pain. One participant said, I would have been more comfortable if I could have done it at home and not spent four hours wandering around Limerick and then three hours on two buses, bleeding and feeling emotional. This has changed since the COVID-19 protocol was introduced and patients are no longer obliged to take the pill in front of the GP. They're allowed to bring it home and start the procedure, which is best for them. And ARC recommends that this would be continued um, after the COVID-19 pandemic. And many participants noted that the introduction of telemedicine made access to abortion easier for them as it reduced travel. So usually um, patients travel for, for one, um, for one consultation, which makes it a lot easier for people. So in terms of abortion care under 12 weeks gestation, overall respondents reported mostly positive experiences of access and abortion care with the GP and women's health clinics. One participant said, my GP was phenomenal. She was non-judgmental, open, kind and helpful. And there are many, many positive um experiences of um of their gps throughout, throughout the report and and the support in which they got from women's health clinics and gps many examples of that there were issues however with gps who were non-providers so for example uh one participant said the initial gp i went to informed me that they do not do that here and then considered charging me 60 euro for a two-minute consult and the consultation should be free anyway. However, a PPSN is needed to access uh, an abortion free of charge. And um, this is a significant barrier for some migrants who are, are waiting on, on registration. There is a lack of choice in relation to surgical abortion. One participant said arranging the hospital appointment was fiddly. Apparently, many, do, many people do not opt for surgical. So the patient should have the option between an early medical abortion or a surgical abortion. However, the findings in the report found that um, this is often very difficult and in some cases uh, impossible to arrange. In terms of experience in the hospital, um, which is 10 to 12 week gestational age, the patient's experience um, were overwhelmingly negative. One participant said, the facilities in the hospital were awful. One toilet for five women, which was covered in blood. Staff were unprepared and unorganized. In one case, a woman said, after I had swallowed the first pill, they then told me they didn't have the second pill in stock. She asked me about adoption after I took the first pill, which was very insensitive and also obviously too late. 
The gestational age of one participant's pregnancy was estimated incorrectly and they unnecessarily traveled to the UK. They said, I was told I was over 12 weeks and had to travel and pay around 600 euro. Turns out I was eight weeks and was told 12 weeks incorrectly by the doctor and didn't have to travel or spend all my savings. It's just upsetting knowing I could have accessed the service for free, but I was sent away due to a simple error. Respondents overall res uh, reported insufficient uh, facilities, lack of compassion for medical staff and refusal of surgical procedure when requested. In terms of travel abroad for abortion care, the reasons were usually because they had passed the 12 week gestational limit or because they were diagnosed with a fetal abnormality, but it did not fall within the restrictive bounds of the legislation. Traveling abroad for abortion health care due to the pandemic added significant stress and isolation. Participants stated that it was tiring, more expensive, and they felt let down, lonely and isolated. Another participant said travel made it much more difficult and extremely traumatic. And there's many examples of this throughout the report. Overall, we need better access to abortion in cases of FFA. And I think what's really special um, about this report is uh, that women's voices are heard the whole way throughout the report. Their experiences recorded in every step of the way of the, of, um, of, the of the of the process, and even they're even heard in the recommendations as well. What also came out was was gratitude from the respondents. Many expressed gratitude for the care that they received, and they thanked those who fought for legislative change and worked towards implementing the services. One participant said, "I feel so grateful to everyone who campaigned on repealing the eighth and who made it possible for someone like myself to be able to have an abortion in this country. Another said, I never thought I would appreciate repeal in this way. And another said, I had an illegal abortion with pills in Ireland in 2016. This experience was so much different. Thank you for all you've done. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for that, Lorraine. I think the fact, I think we often remember, realize that it's still quite difficult in many ways to access abortion, but that for so many people, every single abortion that we have that is just normal and a regular part of their healthcare is a massive victory. And I really thank you for, for pointing that out to us. Okay, I'm gonna remove, excuse me while I do some technical Zoom things, remove the spotlight from you. And I'm gonna switch us to, the lovely Mary Favier. Um, again, sorry, doing two things at once. Um, so Mary Favier is a general practitioner in Cork. She is a founding member of Doctors for Choice Ireland and current co-chair of Global Doctors for Choice. Um, Mary, can I hand over to you? Hi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, the uh, possibility and the, the privilege of speaking today. It's it's just wonderful to, to be at this side of the referendum and, and to see where we've got to. Uh, and so I really welcome the report and it's a fantastic piece of work. It, it, it's a report that makes for some difficult reading. It, some of it was as a general practitioner, as a provider, as a campaigner, found, I found it hard, but there were other parts of it that were really uplifting and absolutely fantastic to see that the service is working. And the, while there are many, many things to, to improve, the, the, the bones of it, the structure of it is there. And I think to put it in perspective, here we are in September, two years, nine months since the start of the service. And it's likely that between 15,000 and 17,000 women and, and anyone who seeks abortion has accessed the service successfully. And, and that is, I think, an absolute credit to all the people who put all the work in over the years. And so those many of many of you who are probably watching today, it, it's to say thank you on the part of the women who expressed extraordinary gratitude to us as providers, because we're the front face of it. But they very often, as Lorraine referenced in, in her commentary, they reference the, the, those people who campaigned. And it's to offer this opportunity to say thank you to, to all of you. 
But I think what it does show is that there's a lot done and, and lots more to do. And th there's lots of learnings in it. And that's what's really fantastic. There's some really concrete things we, we can take from here. So first of all, I'm going to look at them very much wearing my, my GP hat. So I'm a general practitioner in Cork. Um, I'm a provider of the service. Uh, I'm a founder member of Doctors for Choice. I'm a founder member of the Start Providers Group. And I'm also now co-chair of Global Doctors for Choice, really trying to take the work, all the learnings we, we got and gained through the campaign and as doctors to, to a wider international audience. So I, I'll approach things first as a, as a GP. And I think the thing that's apparent in the, in the report and is very much in our experience is that it's, it's unfortunately a service of two halves. There's the service up to 10 weeks in the in general practice where things could be better, but it's substantially working. And there's the hospital based service between 10 and 12 weeks and then then after 12 weeks. And the difficulties are that between 10 and 12 weeks, as is well noted in the report, we only have 10 of the 19 hospitals providing and then very much add on patch on services. Now, some absolutely heroic providers within those hospital services, both both Obscani people and most particularly the midwife coordinators who we couldn't run the service from a GP point of view without. So they need to be acknowledged. But there, there are, are issues there. From the GP point of view, interesting things came out. The pain and bleeding one. We had identified that in the start group within about six months that pain was much more of an issue than, than we had appreciated. Through all the international literature, and when you hear a lot about the online provision of, of, of abortion pills, everybody's always concerned about, about the bleeding. And is there too much bleeding? Is it safe? Can you be at home alone? And all those issues that knock on from bleeding are on safety. But what we found as providers, that the pain was a much bigger issue that, than we had, we had realized. And it's routine for most of us, and this is what I do, is to call women the day after they've taken the second set of tablets at home, just to see how they've been doing, how they managed, and, and you know, really very much to check is, is the abortion complete or going to be complete. But pain is one of the things we quickly realized was bigger. It was bigger. So we went from in our initial guidelines where we said, uh, here, you know, I can give you a prescription for pain relief to saying here is a prescription for pain relief and I suggest you take it and I suggest this is how you take it, you take it before you start. So it's really interesting to see that this is reflected again through, through this study and there is definitely more work can, can be done about that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all very useful learnings. Interesting one about the, the follow up. Um, that women didn't feel that they got sufficient follow-up. Whereas our experience is that most women say that we're too assiduous with the follow-up. We, we, we are really careful we're not harassing women in the follow-up. So as I say, it's usual to ring the next day, but we need to make contact two weeks later to do a low sensitivity pregnancy test. And I have about a one in 10 success rate in actually getting that test back. Uh, and I can understand that. Women are done. They've had the experience. It's been successful and they move on. Absolutely rightly so. And there's only a limited amount we can do anyway. I can only ring a phone a certain number of times when it could be, potentially be a problem at home. And I'm not going to text people either because who reads messages and so on and so forth. So, I just think there's an interesting one about the follow-up, but what it does tell me is that there are some women we need to identify who very much do want to follow up and, and we need to have a better way of identifying who they are. And that there's a piece of work in, in that. I was really surprised to see the one that, that women were felt that they were, the contraception conversations were too active and that contraception was effectively being forced on them. And we would argue that, you know, it, it would be negligent if we didn't raise the issue of contraception that women felt that they could also access it. But again, I think there's issues we could learn there in terms of the sensitivity of how that information is delivered and the absolute entitlement for, for women not to, to hear conversations about contraception or seek conversation. Um, it's loud and clear that the issue of, of providers or lack of providers, uneven providers. We now have over 400 providers, which is roughly one in three GPE practices have a provider, which is great. Thankfully, we now have all the counties covered. But if you just take Sligo as an example, which was the, the latest one to complete um, all 26, the biggest barrier there was the lack of provision in, in a local hospital because as GPs, we would refer about one in 10 to the hospital service as a consultation on the phone, not necessarily in person where you're asking about an ultrasound or pathways or follow-up. So 
one of the biggest barriers to the increased provision of, of providers is actually around the fact that, that the hospital services in so much of the West and Midwest and Northwest, we don't have a hospital backup. And I think if we're to campaign about anything, it's just that it's not acceptable two and a half years later to say that it's okay somehow that only 10 of our 19 maternity units provide and substantially more needs to be done about that. And we need to jump up and down about it. it it's just not okay. The recruitment of new GPs as providers got, got slow during COVID inevitably, it was harder to run training programs, but we've adapted them now to Zoom. But it was also, GPs have just been slammed. And unfortunately it's not over yet because there's a very substantial dearth of you know, care around non-COVID issues coming back. And also there's very substantial issues around the recruitment of GCs and the shortage of GPs, but they're, they're issues for us to, to really do work on. I actually thought the safe access zones might, might feature more, but didn't, but potentially because they're limited to certain practices. But I, I think there's a piece of work to be done there to try and talk to, to women and patients more about what that experience has been like, because it must be pretty awful to have to run, run the gauntlet. I think then to look at it in general issues, um, we had identified through some other studies we have been doing that the My Option service is not as well known as, as we'd like. And that there really has been, if you think about it, we can all see this, an absolute dearth of advertising around my options, around the abortion service, around the fact that it's free. And this is a really useful flag in this study to say, actually, I think we took that foot off the pedal a little bit there, all of us, to say we need to be uh, out there promoting, advertising, talking, creating conversations about the abortion service, because it's not yet. Uh, embedded in a, the community understanding of our healthcare service that, that this is available and that it's a free free service. There's a piece of work to be done as well around the whole issue identified in this study and one that we've identified because I wear other hats. I do a lot of education work with the Irish College of GPs, which is our quality and standards body and covers training. I'm, I'm a past president of the ICGP, who is we've trainings running into the autumn now, really focusing on non-providers. And I don't mean the, the, the conscientious objection or the obstructors. I mean the, the, the bulk of GPs who aren't providers for whatever reason to really make sure they have an understanding and to look at what's the minimum knowledge a competent general practitioner who should have who's a not a provider in terms of care for these women uh, and, and the pathways. Because one of the things you need to appreciate is in Doctors for Choice uh, and with others as we were trying to conceptualize the service beforehand what would a service look like? What should it look like? We were very committed to the fact that abortion is healthcare and or abortion should be routine healthcare. So it should be local, it should be community-based, it should be in general practice. And we knew that that would bring us very specific challenges, but we were really committed to the fact that it would be a better service as opposed to the clinic-based service, which is often, often charitable, but run it as a, as a, a subcontracted service from the health service, as would be the, the UK model. And so, but we knew that the challenges we were going to have in making this an embedded community service where abortion is healthcare was a long haul road. It was going to require many, many years of, of education to embed the service. And I think for two and a half years, it's been a huge success. And we're really pleased with where we've got to, but I think this, this is a 15 to 20 year project to really make this different. And we're, you know, we knew this was the way to go, but it has not been done anywhere else before. We are the first you know, model country to do it, and it's now accepted by the WHO as international best practice. And we're really proud of it. But but there's a lot there's a lot to be done, and it's it is better this way. Otherwise, we were likely to have two or three clinics in Ireland because they wouldn't be financially viable. And you could just imagine what it would have been like for women going in the door, running the gauntlet of protesters, and the, the very substantial travel that would have been involved but I think for us it's been a success I think this type of report is really useful because it it provides us with a lot of information it makes us take a bit of a deep breath and reflect and say oh god not great like wouldn't be always proud of that service but it motivates it motivates us both as GPs but also as advocates and activists and I just want to say really well done to the abortion rights campaign. You've just been the flag bearers for so long and that you've been so important to us in Doctors for Choice and Start as, as supporters. And a lot done, loads more to do. And, and we're here, we're more than happy to help. Thank you. Sorry, I've left poor Shelley there on her own. Oh, I'm gonna just 
come in very quickly. Thank you, uh, Mary. I mean, you say that we're the flag bearers. I feel like you're one of my definite abortion heroes. So I'm always in awe of all of the uh, of all of the people who who consistently provide, um, even when it's not easy. Um, and I'm now delighted to introduce our second speaker, uh, Mara Clark, founder of Charity Abortion Support Network, which has been helping people cross European borders to access abortion since 2009. She can't wait until the amazing groups campaigning for abortion law reform make ASN obsolete. Mara, I'm going to hand over to you. Well, thank you. First of all, I'm the third speaker. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's okay, Helen, we forgive you. Um, the devil is in the details. Um, here I come to bring the mood down. Um, so Abortion Support Network is not here for the people who can easily access care in any circumstance. We are here for the people who find obstacles to care. And um, I live in the dark. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm always happy about the sunshine and light. Um, and sometimes we even see it. Uh, you know, we had repeal and from six months before the referendum and then after while they were figuring out provision, we were shouting as loud as we could about the people who were gonna be left behind by this legislation. Um, we worked with the clinics to estimate how many people from the Republic of Ireland would still need to travel after legislation. Our estimate was six to 800 people. So if you look at the numbers of people giving Irish addresses at UK clinics, you'll see that it was 375 in 2019 and 195, I think, in 2020. And I am saying, where are the rest? Where are they? And um, you know, reports like this are great because they're able to take a pulse of the people who are able to access care. And Lorraine, thank you very, very much. Because every time I raise the question of these missing people, I'm basically told, oh, they're all getting care in Ireland. So I'm really glad that your study shows that at least 21 people were not able to get care in Ireland. Um, I would like to say that in 2019, ASN heard from 159 residents of the Republic of Ireland. In 2020, we heard from 158 residents from the Republic of Ireland. And in 2021 through August, we have heard from 129 residents of the Republic of Ireland. Um, so this is a problem, but also for me, the problem is where are the rest of them? And we, now that COVID is dissipated and we can be a little more creative, we actually, we have earmarked funding, we want to help to reach people. And of course, this thing of like, how do you reach the unreachable people? Like any ideas though, seriously, billboards, stickers, whatever, please bring them. But um, let's, let's take a step back. First of all, there's this question of, information. Yeah, a lot of people have no idea where to go for information and then they Google. Now you try Googling abortion from an Irish IP and I guarantee you're going to see the silent scream uh, and get a lot of information about anti-abortion organizations. Um, the other thing is, is that for people who fall outside of provision, there is zero pathway for them. You know, completely zero pathway. So either they go to their GP and some GPs are great, but not all GPs live in abortion world like we do. And, you know, so it's like, oh, well, you're over 12 weeks. Even if the pathway is call abortion support network, I don't care, just make a pathway. The other thing is, is that the, um, the three day, the non medically necessary, ridiculous three day wait period is pushing a lot of people over the limit, we get people contacting us at 12 week one, 12 week two, 12 week three. We get people contacting us at 11 five, telling us that they're too late to get, um, to get treatment in the Republic of Ireland. Um, personally, I think any time limit is stupid. You give me a time limit, I will give you the person one day over that time limit that will make you change your mind about time limits. Um, also, uh, you know, we talked about the lack of knowledge of how much pain uh, is involved with an early medical abortion. There's also the fact that almost all abortions in the Republic of Ireland are done with pills. It's virtually impossible to get a surgical procedure to the point where we have heard from people who were given pills once they didn't work. Then they were given pills twice and then they didn't work. In some cases they were given pills three times. So three times spending five hours cramping, bleeding, chills, fever, diarrhea. Then you're over 12 weeks and you're told to get off to England or to continue the pregnancy, but then they're scaremongered by medical professionals that the pills might've hurt the baby, but don't worry, 
they won't have hurt the baby enough for you to get an abortion under the fetal indication regulation in, um, in the Republic of Ireland. There need to be more choice in terms of how people get abortions. I appreciate the, the service was set up super quickly. But for me, if you start an abortion in one country, you shouldn't then be forced, if that, if that, if that treatment doesn't work, you shouldn't then be forced to pay hundreds of pounds or euro or whatever, or whatever currency you do um, to travel to another, uh, another country. That to me is state mandated medical negligence. Uh, then let's talk about your delightful legislation around what counts as a fatal fetal indication. Um, back in the glory days of the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, we used to have women and pregnant people being told that they were not suicidal enough to access care under PDLPA. And now we have couples with wanted pregnancies being told, oh, get more tests. Oh, get more tests. Oh, get more tests. And they are later and later and later in pregnancy. And doctors' hands are tied by legislation which criminalizes them for guessing wrong what, you know, whether or not a baby will 100% die within 28 days of being born. It is insulting, it is cruel, it is unusual. It is, I, I literally I realize I'm talking very fast. I apologize to our ISL interpreter, um, but there's, there's a lot. And then also the people who we've really noticed are missing now are the marginalized people homeless people, people in direct provision, members of the Irish traveler community, people who ASN used to hear from quite a lot because people used to know that if you were pregnant, you could go to IFPA or Well Woman or Femme Plus. And they knew that those were like the bad places that people who needed abortions could go. But now they have to go to a GP. They have to go like inside the system. And a lot of people are outside the system. So again, where are they and how can we find them and how can we help them access care? Um, let's not even talk too much about COVID and, and how our average grant has gone from 500 pounds per person to 900 pounds per person and how for a little while COVID tests were costing each traveler 400 extra euro. The, the tests are less expensive now, but the Irish government is still pretty waffly about whether or not traveling for med medical care means that you can not get a COVID test. You actually still need to get a test. Actually, do you know what? The regulations literally changed today. So let me get back to you. But even that, like this extra, who can travel? What letters do you need? What tests do you need? What vaccinations do you need? Um, and then there's stigma. You know, there's this like, it used to be that we used to say that people would think that, oh, if it was rape or if it was fetal indication, that was a good abortion. But everybody else, that was a bad abortion. Whereas for us, there are no good abortions or bad abortions. There's no good reasons. There's no bad reasons. There's people who want to continue a pregnancy and people who do not want or cannot uh, continue a pregnancy. But I feel like the 12-week limit is really creating a different kind of good abortion, bad abortion dichotomy. And some of the language that our callers have reported getting from medical workers, and again, love me my start doctors, but people have been told things like, um, just like really bad things. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat. And this is also particularly true with people with fetal indication who are being told to delay and delay and delay traveling for treatment with language like, Oh, but surely you wouldn't be able to live with yourself if you didn't know the full extent of what's wrong with your baby. Even though they're literally being told the baby's not gonna live or the baby's not gonna have a good quality of life and they've made the decision to have the treatment. Um, but we also, we get, we get language from people about, from, from medical social workers and other people within the healthcare system for people over 12 weeks, really shaming and stigmatizing language about how these, how these girls get themselves into trouble. And I'm like, are you, are you mad? It's, it's 2021. Um, <clears throat> we could talk about Brexit. We could talk about the fact that anybody who's living in the Republic of Ireland who is not an EU or a UK citizen needs a visa to travel. And those visas have become much harder to get since the Brexit vote. Also from the 1st of October, you actually will need a passport to get into the United Kingdom. We're still waiting for confirmation 
as to whether or not that includes people from the Republic of Ireland, but I know it includes people from mainland Europe. Um, and that could be a very big problem because currently you can fly Aer Linguists with a social worker card, uh, which as you can imagine is all the photo IDs of our clients have. Also, <laughs> your law puts your people at the mercy of healthcare services in another country. The wait times in UK clinics right now for second trimester abortion are three weeks, <laughs> three weeks. So when you consider the cost of an abortion doubles at 14 weeks and triples at 19 weeks. And if you don't know you're pregnant until you're 16 weeks and then you mess around trying to find the post 12 week pathway in Ireland, and then you call us and you're 19 weeks and then there's a three week limit on it. Anyway, anyway, all I'm saying is Ireland's abortion law, when it works, it's like the girl with the curl. When it works, it is very, very good. And when it doesn't work, it's very, very bad. And if I sound frustrated, it is because I have been saying the same things since a year before you all started providing abortion. And like, we just wanna help the people who can't be helped in the Republic of Ireland. We very much wish everybody could be helped in the Republic of Ireland. We appreciate that's not the way the world works, but all we are saying is do better. Just, you know, do better. Keep up the good work, do better. Um, thanks, Lorraine, for the report because um, politicians and other people love, you know, data and facts and numbers. And hopefully, 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 some things will improve after the repeal review. Thanks. Thank you, Mara, and thank you for reminding us that we have to stay angry about things. I think that sort of it's uh, I'm yeah, I mean, I'm always angry about things, as as you know, well, but I, I think that sort of it, it, so many of the things that you're talking about come down to those fundamental issues with how our health system works and how we treat people in society and those those really sort of, I guess, basic issues um, about how we deal with people. Um, and I'm, I want to go punch something now, but I won't. I will hand you over instead to our last speaker. I'm not going to try and work out which number she is because clearly basic, basic mathematics is beyond me. I'm going to hand you over to Maraid Enright. She is a reader in feminist legal studies at the University of Birmingham and a founder member of Lawyers for Choice. And with Fiona de Londres, she wrote Appealing the Eighth, Reforming Irish Abortion Law. Right. Hey, um, thanks. Um, I, oh, thanks very much, Helen, and uh, everyone in um, Ark for, for inviting me. Um, as Mara was speaking, I sort of uh, felt that old anger kind of rising up. So if I'm a little bit uh, trembly or red, that'll be why. Um, I'm going to just briefly kind of outline some of the human rights issues that kind of come at us from, um, from the wonderful report that, that Lorraine presented earlier. And I'm going to take quite a brief surface thematic approach. And then if people have more detailed questions, we can kind of drill down afterwards. But as with Mara, you know, for those of you who have been involved in abortion rights campaigning in Ireland for a while, the legal arguments will be familiar because some of the legal arguments we made about why abortion law under the Eighth Amendment was inadequate, why the law needed reform, what breaches of human rights were taking place in Ireland pre-2018, some of those arguments still apply today. They may apply to a smaller number of people, um, but, you know, the point of human rights arguments is to say that everyone's human rights matter, every individual violation matters, and some of these violations are quite serious. So before I kind of get into um, the main, the two main human rights arguments, I just want to make two short points. So one is that, um, you know, ARC and other groups have produced um, reports into the operation of the abortion service, and there are a couple of others that are forthcoming. And those reports are excellent and they tell us a lot about people's experience of the system. But one thing that struck me in the last couple of days as I was going through these materials is just how inadequate the notification statistics that the government publishes are. And so there are some things that I can speculate about and I'm 90% certain that I'm right, but I can't point to official case statistics in the way that I would be able to if I were examining the UK or any of a number of other countries. And so that's one thing the review could very usefully do is to improve the data collection, you know, as we were all requesting um, in 2018. The second thing to say, and this comes out in, in the ARC report, is that human rights issues do not only arise when we're talking about barriers to access. I think we've seen this particularly in the last year in Ireland. There is a real um, political and medical 
uh, reluctance to recognize medical spaces as spaces where human rights violations can occur. But some of the things documented in the ARC report around, let's say, choice of method, dignity, stigma, treatment, quality of hospital facilities uh, for women seeking abortions by comparison with women seeking other kinds of care which are not stigmatized in the same way. Um, really quite serious questions around informed consent where women say they weren't sure what was going to happen, how much pain was going to be involved and so on. Those are human rights issues and uh, it's important, I know ARC will continue to do so, that we're advocating for woman centeredness, that human rights are not just a floor, a bare, a bare minimum um, of protection for women and pregnant people in the healthcare uh, system. So as uh, pre-2018, there are two major kinds of rights violation that we see embedded in Ireland's current um, abortion legislation. One is violations of the right to private life, and private life covers things like bodily autonomy and self-determination. And the other is our old friend, the right to freedom from cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Um, so some of you may remember that in 2010, the European Court of Human Rights handed down a judgment in a case called A, B and C and Ireland. And the basic nugget of law that came down to us from that case was if you legalize abortion, you, that legal abortion must be practically available to those who are entitled to it. You must put the procedures, laws, guidelines and processes in place that make that service accessible in practice. Ireland has now expanded the range of people who are entitled to access an abortion, but particularly post I mean, I think it's fair to say, particularly post 10 weeks or the middle of the ninth week, issues arise around procedure, referral, treatment and so on that mean that uh, legal abortion is not always accessible in practice where it should be um, accessible on the books. And the main issue or the main way I want to conceptualize the consequences of that lack of procedural clarity, which is documented um, in, in Lorraine's and other reports, I want to conceptualize it in terms of delay. And delay is always a human rights issue because women have a right to, to reasonable clarity around how they can access these legal services, which go to the root of their, their bodily integrity, their health and so on. Um, but we see the consequences of delay most profoundly, of course, where delay leads to refusal, as, for example, where somebody times out of the strict 12-week uh, um, time limit. And the human rights consequences of delay of, are, of course, most profoundly visible in those cases where that Article 8 procedural protection intersects with that Article 3 protection against uh, cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, as, for example, where somebody uh, who has had a diagnosis of the fetal indications that Mara was talking about uh, finds that they are compelled to travel. Some of you will remember the two cases of uh, Mellet and Whelan, Amanda Mellet and Siobhan Whelan, um, where uh, the European Human Rights, sorry, the United Nations Human Rights Committee uh, found against Ireland and said that this requirement of women to travel to terminate pregnancies in cases of fatal fetal anomaly breached their right to freedom from uh, torture and human and degrading treatment. Um, and we know all the reasons for that. Uh, some of the stories uh, collected in the ARC study, which are reproduced in the report, are, as far as I'm concerned, um, equivalent to the stories of Amanda Mellet and Siobhan Whelan, because where the, uh, the committee placed its focus in those two judgments wasn't on the medical status of the fetus, but on what the experience of having to travel for that kind of, ter of termination does to the woman and does to her partner and so on. It's the infliction of severe physical and mental distress that is key to that human rights violation. And termination for medical reasons have been saying for years that they are still seeing people who are put through all of the things that we heard about during the repeal campaign, including stigma, isolation, profound grief, um, uh, being unable to mourn a child properly, and so on and so forth. So all of those women we promised we would bring home are still uh, vulnerable in many respects to the same rights violations that we were supposed to be addressing uh, with the 2018 Act. Even when we're talking about 12 weeks and people who qualified 12 weeks, it's important to bear in mind that there is no practical safety net after 12 weeks, because as the ARC report uh, shows, um, sufficient use is not being made of the health ground. This is one of those places where better statistics would be really helpful. But from what little we know, that health ground, which says you should be able to access where there is a risk of serious harm to your health, 
from what we know, it is only being utilized in cases where there is also a risk to life. That's not what the ground is designed for. That's not what it should be doing. And so there is a very real risk that women whose health uh, is in jeopardy, but whose life is not, uh, you know, so somebody who's at risk of a long term severe impact on their health, for instance, maybe not permanent, possibly permanent, but they're not going to die from this condition. They're not discussed or covered at all in the guidelines on interpreting that part of Section 9. And it looks to us as if they drop off um, a cliff edge. And there could be an inhuman and degrading treatment issue there if somebody is exposed needlessly to a long term uh, health problem that could otherwise uh, have been avoided by an earlier termination. Um, so it's worth uh, kind of saying as well, and this comes out, of course, in both the report and in what Mara says, that the risks, all of those risks that I've talked about, risk of those kinds of human rights violations are unequally distributed. And there are all kinds of equalities issues around who is most likely to be placed at risk in that way. But in terms of the review, I just wanted to say one last thing, right? I wanted to, us to kind of think about the causes of delay. And as far as I can see, there are three kinds. There is statutory, so prescribed by the legislation itself. There are systemic, so things that aren't prescribed by the legislation, but have nevertheless been set out as a matter of policy. And then there are very serious issues around interpretation of the legislation. So the statutory causes of delay include things like the, the compulsory uh, non-waivable three-day waiting period. So that's prescribed by law, and that's obviously a cause of delay. But then there are things that are not uh, prescribed by law. So, for example, the requirement that women be transferred to hospital 10 to 12 weeks, that's a policy decision. That's not set out in the legislation. And as the ARC report and others uh, show, that's obviously a cause of delay, which affects, for example, rural women, disabled women, uh, women in the, in, in the direct provision system and so on. Uh, children, uh, people living with a controlling partner, all of these people are more likely to be affected by that policy decision. And that is not, in, in my understanding, clinically justified unless there is another comorbidity, another health problem. Uh, sorry, not another health problem because pregnancy isn't a health problem, but there's a, another risk alongside the inherent risk um, of pregnancy uh, itself. Um, another is the use of multidisciplinary teams for the post 12 week grounds. So where the legislation says two doctors shall decide, but we have some evidence that decisions are taken on a consensus basis between much larger teams. And obviously that opens up more room for disagreement and delay. And then there's this last question of interpretation. So the main thing that's going on here, you know, we talk a lot about conscientious objection, conscientious obstruction, but we are seeing, and this was predicted, Doctors are still criminalized if they step outside the bounds of the legislation, and that leads to more conservative interpretation than is necessary. So even though the legislation says as long as a doctor decides reasonably and in good faith, they're not at risk of prosecution, there is nevertheless that sense that they might be. Chilling effects were discussed already in A, B and C in Ireland. This is not a new idea. But that, that caution that may be related to the fear of criminalization leads to all kinds of unexpected consequences. You know, refusing to treat women at 11 weeks and four days, five days, six days, even though they're still technically entitled to access. Over referral for ultrasound, which is in itself a cause of delay. Underuse of that really crucial um, health ground, and of course, extreme caution around the fetal indications provision, which says, you know, fatal enough, not fatal enough, where fatal enough means likely to die within 28 days. So, uh, so even if we're confident that the fetus will die at some point, let's say in the first year of life, that's not enough. You have to be able to pick this arbitrary 28 days. I would think that in the most severe cases, it would be possible to argue before a European court and possibly before a domestic court, that that 12 week limit is much too hard, that particularly in cases where a person has a fetal uh, indication diagnosis, a severe pre-existing health condition or any of a number of other circumstances, that the fact that that 12 week line will not budge is a disproportionate and unnecessary interference in the woman's fundamental human rights. I'll say something, two little provocative things and then I'll finish. The first thing is that everything I have said there was predictable and was in fact predicted. I can see that there are some TDs and senators who have sent people to listen to the seminar. 
I would urge them to go back into their email archives where you will find the amendments that were proposed at the time the legislation was being debated by ARC, by the National Women's Council, by Lawyers for Choice, and in particular by the Irish Family Planning Association in cooperation with a small number of TDs and senators who were listening to us. The amendments that are necessary to make this legislation work better are already drafted, but they were not engaged with. The one that was, was the requirement that we have this three-year review, which I suppose is why we're, why we're here at the moment. The last thing is I just want to think, I keep saying chilling effects because we're used to saying chilling effects, but I'd like us to think about how we reframe that. So we seem to understand because it was part of the 2013 debate and so on, that some, uh, some doctors are afraid that if they offer uh, abortion care to the full extent permitted by law, that they are running risk of criminalization. And that is a cause of fear and that leads to restrictive interpretation. I would like to see an Ireland in which the chilling effect goes the other way, in which we are so afraid of subjecting a woman to torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. We are so afraid of destroying another woman that it chills the temptation to interpret legislation conservatively. We still haven't gotten to that point in Ireland. That's what the politics of this review, in my view, or at least the legal dimension of the politics, uh, needs to be about. So thanks, thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I really appreciate you pointing out that issue of the fact that these are things that we knew were going to be problems. We This isn't many of these problems, uh, things, for example, about pain and so on are, are maybe new or different, but a lot of these issues we knew we were going to have beforehand. So I want to thank everyone for speaking today um, and for their presentations. We do have time for some questions from the floor. You can either raise your hand and myself and my lovely colleague, also called Mary, um, can unmute you or you can send a question to myself or to the ARC account through the chat box, and then we can read them to the speakers for you. Um, I'm going to start with a question, I suppose, for to, to an extent for Mary, but also for sort of everyone, I suppose I'm going to also unmute you all so you can actually answer questions rather than me just hoping that you'll jabber into the, the, the nonsense. Um, sort of a lot of these issues, and, and, and we all kind of touched on this a little bit, on are these just issues with abortion services or are these broader issues with our healthcare services? Would you say that these link to sort of, I guess, deeper misogyny in how we treat women in healthcare or are they specific to abortion? Uh, I think the answer to that is both. Uh, I think because we have a very significant public-private divide and huge discrimination as a result in our health services to those who can only access services through the public system, there, there is inevitably human rights violations there and discrimination. And uh, we're a gendered society. Uh, we are a gendered healthcare providers. Our, our legislative framework is gendered. Our funding is gendered. And inevitably, that impacts disproportionately on women, children, those with disabilities, minorities, the, the list we always have. I think then you add in a significant um, stigma aspect, uh, you know, the historic issues around the provision of a new service. I think you just apply, you have multipliers. And, but it's, I think it's embedded in wider problems. And we need to address wider problems as, as well as this one. Thank you. I might just add to that as well, if you don't mind, Helen. Um, I think especially in, in the 10 to 12 week category, when women go into the hospital, they're on wards with, you know, maybe five other women who actually, you know, have wanted pre pregnancies in most cases. And then they're they're there and they're experienced in their abortion. And, and that is that is a structural problem. And I think that that needs to be moved maybe out of the maternity services and into a more gynecological um, you know, ambulatory kind of setting, um, because it's just, it's putting women in a really difficult position. Mm -hmm. So for instance, an example there is, is that the, the providing hospitals received a, a, a ring fenced budget to provide these services and individual hospitals have for whatever reason not decided to use the budget for those services and have amalgamated it into the general gynae service, which was always grossly under, underfunded and under-resourced. And you can see why they might do it, but that, that shouldn't be allowed. And that, that, that should be a source, there should be investigations about that. And you know, there should be a seat to end on, on what's being, the budget is being used for. And the provision of surgical termination is a classic example of, of what has suffered because we need specific training around MVA and MVA you know, med, you know, evac, using evacuation techniques can be done in a community setting and could be provided by midwives. It doesn't need to be doctors. 
And it's that type of, of prioritization. But that's all about resourcing community services in, in, in every aspect and just embedding this service into it. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, uh, I can see Holly has her hand raised, so I'm going to ask you to unmute and then hopefully you'll be able to put your question. Thank you. And sorry, the bells are both bells are ringing here at the moment, but I just had a question. Um, and actually, first of all, thank you so much for this. It's been so informative and really helpful for us, I think, going into the review of the current legislation. Um, in terms of the kind of restrictiveness around the, the classification for a fatal fetal anomaly in the 28 days and stuff, something I've been trying to figure out, say, in legislative terms, like we all know of, or we know people who've had to travel because of that um, particular kind of classification. I'm wondering if if you have any advice on like, would the best way to address that or change it be, do we need to look at changing the what the meaning of fatal is, like the 28 day thing? Is it removing that entirely from our legislation and kind of saying we need access as early as possible, as late as necessary, a decision between her woman and a doctor? Do we remove the fatal bit? I'm just wondering if anybody could point me in a good direction in terms of changing the legislation to, to ensure that everybody can access it eventually. I guess is any, I, I can come in on that. I, I, from, I think from the abortion rights campaign's point of view, whatever limit you put in, and I know Myra said something similar before, you'll find someone who falls slightly out of it, but that who should deserve care. I think we are always of the opinion that there's no situation in which you should, should force someone to remain pregnant against their will. And that means as early as possible, as late as necessary. You come up with another definition, you're going to find someone else to fall out of it. But I'll let our panel answer that as well. Anyone in particular? Wade, do you want to? Yeah, I can go. Yeah, I think that it's, it's I think it's a question that's well asked. I think there's potentially three aspects to it. I first of all agree, yes, that the definition of fatal and the 28 days has no basis in medicine and there is there is no justification for it. And it, it should it should just be removed in its entirety as opposed to inserting something else. It's the first thing. The second thing I'd say that the, we need to decriminalize you know, abortion provision for doctors because that, that chilling effect is really substantial, but is also hidden behind as, as a, a, a useful excuse. And, and, it, and, and it, I think Mairead made a really, really important point for us that we need to flip how we frame this. We need to flip that we, we get providers and, and hospitals and funders so concerned that they, they, there will be human rights violations if the service is not provided to the highest standard and entirely appropriately to the widest scope that, than the way we are constantly trying to, ch to chip away. But my, so I think we need to remove the 28 day the issue, we need to decriminalize. But the third point we need to do is we need to re re remove this issue of the multi provider sign off. Uh, because it inevitably, what, what we're experiencing is that in the individual units who are providing, there's usually absolute champions, but there's one or two of them. Whereas what they have to do, because this has been set up as best practice, they have to go to a multidisciplinary team meeting and you can have seven, 10, 14 people signing off, potentially individuals who know almost nothing about it, but they're involved in that team. And you just have overwhelming you know, decisions that there's no way that they can beat. And you're, you're left with really committed providers in the hospital setting in particular, who are trying to do all types of workarounds and seek decisions made in advance of these teams, the team meetings. And it's, it's wearing and very difficult. And all you need is one person on annual leave or out and the whole thing falls. Because the, the, the other aspect that hasn't been addressed particularly here is that the right to access a second opinion has been effectively nil. And it, 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 it hasn't been operationalized at all. And I think Mara made a really good point as well that we, we have effectively no formal pathways from primary care to secondary care, first of all, in terms of under 12 weeks, but after 12 weeks, we have no pathway at all because the argument is we don't need one because there's nothing in law, but in, in reality, in terms of, again, applying the, the, the human rights perspective, these are Irish residents who are seeking a legal health service in another country, and therefore they, they, have, they have rights, and we need to assist them and support them as they exercise those rights, and we need to have a clinical pathway of care, and that's another issue that we could put a lot of work into. Thanks. Um. If no one else in the panel wants to come in, I do have a couple of questions on through on text. Can I just um, 
quickly oh, and just just because yeah. just because it might be useful to Holly everything that yeah I'd say everything that Mary says um, I'm also aware that termination for medical reasons are finalizing a submission that does include uh, recommendations for reform so I'd suggest reaching out to them and they're there it's everything Mary says and a couple mm. of other uh, more mm. detailed things um but two of those recommendations that I remember off the top of my head, one is that section 13 entitlement to a formal review of a refusal doesn't seem to be being used at all. So it's in the statute, but it's it's not it's not being um, availed of for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Um, the other thing is that um, it's it, the, the, the health ground, the use of the health ground. So in the UK, sometimes it's possible for people who've had that kind of diagnosis to be treated under the health ground which is different in 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 the in in england and wales but it's recognizing that there are mental and sometimes physical health consequences that it for the woman that follow along with that diagnosis the health ground isn't being used for that purpose in ireland at least as far as we're aware um and uh, oh, and the last thing would be disabled women in Ireland who have been very active on this issue. So like we know that one of the reasons for the attempt to tighten up that ground was to respond to anti-choice arguments about disability and disabled women in Ireland have much more holistic policy suggestions around how parents in that position can be supported to make um, rights centred decisions. So so there is work being done on it. And I, those are the people I'd go to. And just one other issue there is that the when we were negotiating all of this and when it was all signed off and agreed with the minister and the Department of Health, what was accepted as the standard of provision of care was ordinarily resident in Ireland. That was the standard. It's become to be interpreted is having a PPS number and there is a gap where people are falling. And now many GPs do workarounds in the sense that we know the application is, is ongoing. So we provide the service on a pro bono basis and claim it back afterwards. But that's only those who are the committed. But that, that is a funding issue in the Department of Health. And that needs to be called out. It, the, the agreement was ordinarily resident. And, and it's, it's proving a really significant issue, obviously for those who are new arrivals of migrants, but also those for whatever reasons in their communities distrust the, the, the state. So for instance, the Roma community as a, as a general principle, for instance, don't even have medical cards because they don't trust the application process for medical cards, something like 50% of that community. And so it, the, there's a parallel issue around PPS numbers. So you, ha you have uh, an endemic ingrained um, access and discrimination issue because of how it's been interpreted. And that's a, a convenience issue in the PCRS, which is the funding body. Um, thanks, everyone. I do have a question that's coming by text and then I'll go. I can see there's another hand raised. Um, uh, I suppose this question is for Lorraine. Was there anything in the report about access to abortion services for those with disabilities? Uh, there is a small section um, on, on disabilities in the report. There was actually one uh, participant who said that they were at risk of continuing um, with, the, with the pregnancy and that uh, they found it very difficult to, um, to have an abortion under those grounds, even though they told her that, that her health was at risk, um, her physical health. So that was just one experience. Um, then, of course, there was um, a lot of people trying to access um, under the health ground as well and difficulties um, accessing there as well. So, um, yeah, there is there is a um, there's at least one respondent. Yeah, and I know uh, we definitely had other respondents who talked about the complexities of perhaps um, their mental health and the ideas of continuing pregnancy and so on and so forth. Um, so there yeah. is some more detail in the report, which I think uh, either myself or Mary has put the link up to it um, a couple of times. Um, and I can see, Mairead, that you've got your hand up, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hopefully that'll work and you can ask your question. Thank you. Apologies. I am. Um... You were letting me unmute and I pressed the wrong button, so apologies um, about that. But look, I just want to say thanks a million. Um, this has been really, um, uh, really, really interesting. And I suppose it, it touches, my question really touches, I suppose, on what Lorraine was just um, uh, speaking in relation to. And I think that um, really jumps out is, like there's so much that jumps out in this report. And thanks, Lorraine, um, for all the work in relation to this. It's it's really interesting. Um, but that whole reluctance, uh, I suppose, what you categorise as doctors were reluctant to provide abortion when it comes to um, 
risk to health and that we see that almost no abortions are being carried out um, for risk to health. Um, and I'd just be quite interested in relation to that, if, if you have more that you can um, say in relation to that, because I think that's something, um, you know, that really is, um, well, I say astounding, but really it's, uh, I suppose, for all of us who've been in, involved in these kind of things over a number of years, um, you know, it isn't shocking, but, it, you know, it, it is something that I think needs to, uh, to get out there more. And I think the recommendations that you have there um, certainly are um, really useful as well in terms of, you know, the whole issue of whereby, um, you know, that GPs can be reported, etc. So I just would like to hear a little bit more, Lorraine, in relation to that about the risk to health, if that's possible. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, another thing is risk to health includes mental health. And and that's something that's really it's not being interpreted in that way. Um, because we're finding that uh women are finding it very difficult to access under those grounds. But in terms of risk to health, really there's you know, we, we spoke about this, there is a fear of criminalization. And and that is that I think is the the major issue there. And I mean, as Maraid and Mary have have kind of said. Um, that needs to be flipped on its head and, and kind of said, well, you know, not providing is, um, is you know, is, is grounds for a, a human rights violation. So really, I suppose it's been interpreted in a way that there's serious physical risk to the health of the woman. Um, and, you know, what is serious risk and who calculates that risk? Um, and, and I suppose that that is the problem. It's the problem of, of interpretation there. Um, so I'm not sure if, Marie, do you want to say more on that? Because I know you're quite interested in, in that as a ground legally. Uh, in, interested is a nice neutral word, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so there are a few things, um, some of which are in are in this report and some of which are in uh, some of the other reports that have been published, like uh, Sinead Kennedy's report for the National Women's Council. Um, one thing that people may notice is when you know the government publishes its annual figures for how many uh, terminations have taken place in the country at all and then under which sections of the legislation and the health ground isn't an independent independent health ground it's section 9 which is risk to life or risk of serious harm to health so the placement of serious is important because the, the the person making the two doctors making the decision aren't supposed to be concerned with whether it's a one percent fifty percent ninety eight percent risk. What they're supposed to be concerned about is the nature of the harm that may occur to the to, to the person's health. Um, so if you look at the figures that were that are pub, have been published in the last two years for the number of terminations under those that ground, and if you compare that with the figures from the five years when the PLDPA was in operation under the Eighth Amendment. There's not much difference between them, particularly when you remove the emergency cases from, from the stats. And now you could explain that in a number of different ways, like why are those numbers so similar? One reason that might contribute to the similarity of the numbers is that people whose health is at risk can be treated earlier. So if you know for definite that you just can't be pregnant, you can seek a termination pre-12 weeks. So you don't end up in the section nine stats because the pregnancy never gets to that stage. Nevertheless, there is a concern, I think, about what conditions Section 9 is being invoked for. So I did notice in the National Women Council's, Women's Council's report, they refer to the annual report from the Rotunda Hospital, where I think they carried out about five terminations under Section 9. And I thought it was really instructive. I know I'm going deep into this now, but the majority, they said, were for um, pre-viability rupture of membranes. And you saw this, the, the risk of infection that takes place in those kinds of circumstances. From what I recall, that's very close to the Savita Halepanavar's case. So what that suggests is that the section nine, having health and, and risk to health and risk to life in the same section has solved one of the Eighth Amendment problems, which was you know doctors feeling they had to wait until the risk of death was very, very clear. The woman was at death's door. So they clearly don't feel that they have to do that anymore. But I would expect to see Section 9 being used for a much wider range of conditions if we are truly thinking in terms of serious harm to health. Um, because serious doesn't necessarily mean permanent. And serious can encompass, of course, physical and mental. And serious doesn't mean risk to life, right? Um, so the question would be, why isn't it being interpreted more expansively and when is it being used? I think it's instructive as well to look at the IOG guidelines on the health ground. And um, the, 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 the discussion of how the section should be interpreted itself is very brief. 
And the conditions that are named do have a risk to life element, as far as I, I can see. So you're talking about cancer, certain forms of health condition, uh, sorry, heart, heart condition, and so on. Um, the last thing I'd say is that as with FFAs, um, with, as with fetal indicators, uh, the IOG guidance is that you should use a multidisciplinary team. And so the issues that we've had before that, that Mary raised about uh, how difficult it is for committed providers to, to get care for their patients in that multidisciplinary team context um, arise here as well. So, I mean, obviously there was a deliberate decision to include that word serious in the ground, that it was not meant to be equivalent to the much broader pre-24 weeks ground um, in, the, in, the, in the Abortion Act 1967. But I, I really don't think that we realized that that section nine was for uh, Savita Halepanava type cases only, or Michelle Hart type cases only, or Miss Y type cases only. I think it was understood that that was intended to be a genuine health ground. And if it's not being interpreted as such, that's a real issue for the review. Yeah. Mary, did you want to come in on that as well? Yes, I just wanted to add to what Mairead was saying there and address the, the mental health issue. From, from our experience in general practice, this is potentially the most problematic. And as much because the, these women are very often not in hospital. Uh, and, and so they're not, not within a service that might potentially advocate for them. But they, it, is the most, it is the most variable and potentially nebulous in terms of you can only take the woman's word for, you know, uh, uh, for what her, her symptoms are. And there's a huge amount of doubt then cast over that in terms of the veracity, her, you know, her desire to exaggerate. I mean, it's many GPs report, uh, particularly those who are the, the, the stronger advocates in start. It's been a big subject of discussion how the GP has become the advocate in these cases and is chasing around trying to find psychiatrists, trying to find a health service that will engage with them, trying to really seek a service. And it's, it's after 12 weeks always. For, for, for these women, and more often than not failing. And they are often the most marginalized and, and in the most difficult of circumstances. And I think we really need to create a subsection of, of serious health risk that is to do with mental health, because it needs particular protections, because it can't be given a label or a name. And we, we must trust these women to, to, to self-ascribe and describe their own set of symptoms and outcomes. And, and we're failing that. And it, it needs very particular attention. Thanks. Okay. Unless anyone else wants to come in on this, I see I have a couple more hands raised and I do have a lot of questions have actually come into me through text. So hopefully we'll get through everybody. Um, and if we don't, I apologize. Um, but I'm gonna unmute our next raised hand. Hopefully. <laughs> Emmeline, can you? Yes, I think that's, that's me, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is a question for Radio France International. Um, I wanted to know if you have been consulted for the review of the legislation that's coming up very soon, and if you could present very briefly the recommendation you're making if you've been contacted. So uh, I suppose we haven't really been asked about the review in the sense that we don't really know what's going on with the review yet, unless anyone else has learned more information in the last 24 hours that I don't have. Uh, the government uh, has to begin a review by the end of the year. Um, and that's, that's about all I know at the moment. There have been various politicians have said little bits and pieces. We will hopefully have an independent chair. We will hopefully have good consultation with people who have used services. We will hopefully have experts in health and human rights who will be able to speak on it, but uh, we know very little about it. Uh, the report does go in more detail into the kind of recommendations we're gonna make. And I'm gonna ask Mary to just stick that link again in the chat so that people can see it one more time. Um, and when it comes to the actual review, the abortion rights campaign will be making a bigger submission that will look at a lot of things that aren't, maybe didn't come up in the report for whatever reason because they didn't relate to people's experiences. Um, uh, off the top of my head, the biggest things I think we need to do are fully decriminalize abortion, remove the uh, mandatory three-day waiting period and have abortion available as early as possible and as late as necessary on request throughout pregnancy. 
Um, there are lots more things and I could probably take up another two hours of your time telling you specific things I would like to change in abortion provision and I realize our speakers have done that quite well already so unless anyone wants to come in really briefly on their thoughts on the review on anything in particular they would act I just saw you all nodding so I know you all agree with me anyway which is great Thank you. Um, I will I do have another couple of questions from the floor I'm just going to scroll back up through my chat to see if I can find it um, from a community perspective, how do we enable information to marginalized women's groups in a safe manner? Are there booklets? Um, I, what is the best way to reach those people that sort of, I think both Mary and Mara have talked about who aren't being reached where we just don't know, we can't get that information to them. Do you want me oh, to go? sorry, Mara, um, mm. I need to unmute you. Mary, go for it, please, if you can. Oh yeah, no, Ma Mara may actually be better, uh, you know, positioned to do it because she has a very clear idea of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think so that is that is almost, we should start at the end, just and examine who are the subset that are presenting to Mara's service and expand it because it could only be part of it, as she has said, and then start at the other end, which is what we stated came out in this review, was that the majority of Irish women in the Irish population know very little about the abortion service and my options and the fact that it's free. And <clears> we need to meet those two somewhere in the middle and provide, provide for them, them all. But historically, and, and there's really good international evidence to this effect that in the health education framework, a community-based approach where you identify leaders in those specific groups and communities and work with them and ask them, the, the, you know, so first of all, you ask them, is it affecting you and your group? Uh, and we need to seek that information specifically with as wide a net as we can. But then we need to, to, we need to approach those groups and say, OK, what, what do you think we should do? How could we do it? What can we do to support you and your group? And, and there'll obviously be a huge intersection in it you know, to, to access this service. And very particularly ask, what learnings do you suggest we take on board? What education do you think we should take on board? Both, both in within the provider framing of health care and health delivery, but also in the wider advocacy activist area. There's always things can be learned from the people who are at the sharp end of this type of discrimination. And, and we need to pay a lot of attention to that. And it, it wasn't always the biggest focus in repeal, but I think as the service embeds and improves, we, we can we can really narrow our focus to to those who, who are most suffer the discriminations of our current legislation and our current provision thanks i think it's you know it's it's always this question right how do we reach the hard to reach people um you know in the in the in the past um and abortion support network does not in any way shape or form condone vandalism but uh, we know that in, in the past, in the pre-repeal days, um, just going to the, the, the ladies' loos at many fine establishments um, could get you all the information you needed about where to, where to, get, a, where to get an abortion. And, and that's the sort of thing that, that we like to explore. Like, are there communities that we can drop leaflets in or send stickers to? Um, also, you know, a lot of times I, I go to these events and people say, oh, well, but there's all these barriers. And again, like Abortion Support Network, we wish there were no barriers, you know, and also we wish that all these barriers could be overcome by people in the Republic of Ireland. But until that day comes, there is almost no barrier that, that, that we have been presented by a client that we haven't been able to find a creative workaround. And some of you who are on this call have been part of that. Like we, we are not afraid to pick up the phone and ask people for help, like, you know, You've got somebody who can't read or write. Well, you have somebody walk them to the bus station. You have somebody who needs a specific type of like postal order to pay for a visa. You know, like, of course you can't do that for, for everybody, but really any ideas that anybody has feel 100% free to email or tweet or whatever, um, because we really are, the thing that really keeps me up at night are the, are the people who are missing. And those people are continuing pregnancies that they don't want to, which to me is torture. I wonder, I wonder, should we go on the road again? Should oh, we yes. actually run out a campaign right down to, you know, the West Cork Irish Country Women's Association? I'm being yeah. a majority of, but, you know, I know West Cork quite well. And it's like, 
that because that that is representative of community and there are you know you know you know women's groups mothers groups community groups environmental groups whoever back out providing education providing support mm. letting people know their rights because yeah. i think if we're going to take a human rights per, you know perspective on it that's where we need to start and then we can we can roll in with information well did you know you can ring my options or you know you can ring a gp and so on and so forth but the, the the broader part first i think and as well as thanks yeah i mean um alliance for choice in northern ireland just launched a billboard campaign let's do it billboard sky writing hot air balloons zephyr you know stickers and toilets like literally whatever whatever it takes um yeah I think one of the, the things that, that sort of strikes me thinking about that and thinking particularly about marginalized communities, um, we haven't really touched today on the issue of, I suppose, what we call rogue crisis pregnancy agencies. But I think for those of us, now it's face, for those of us who do know a little bit about it, it's people who typically either give false information or intentionally delay people um, until, obviously in Ireland, until they're past the 12 week limit or you know, so on and so forth. Um, but I know from activists on the ground that a lot of these are specifically targeting marginalized communities. They're looking at places where the information, the sort of state information, the my options isn't getting. And they're intentionally putting that information in those places very specifically in order to delay people. So I think that sort of we, we need to, to look at that point. And I, Mara, I love your point that there's no barrier that you can't figure out with supports. I think we often talk about making things accessible and so on and so forth. And I think that actually we can make everything accessible. We can make abortion accessible for everyone. We need to look at individual circumstances and individual people. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. It's not impossible. We can always be better. It's going to be work, but um, we can certainly always do it. Yeah, I, I just want to make clear there are barriers that we can't overcome <laughs> no I mean but I, I mean I feel like if we all band together there are yeah no 100 100 percent I mean sometimes people contact us when they're over the legal limit in the UK and then they're then they're just done or like they need a visa to travel and there's no and and that visa is not going to be processed in time but things like you know okay the bus from Galway to Dublin isn't wheelchair accessible well then we'll find a, a, a van or people who are like oh but that person needs a visa to travel yeah that's okay like we can you know, um, there's other things that get more complicated, like childcare. Um, and, you know, like I am a single parent, I can't find somebody to watch my kid so I can go to cinema, much less somebody who can come to my house at five o'clock in the morning and stay for three days. Um, but yeah, I just really, I feel like because people don't know, you know, the people who know, know that we've been doing this for a long time and there's lots of great grassroots support and a lot of creative problem solvers but other people just see obstacle and then just have kind of a defeatist attitude towards it. I also think it's important that we, we, we've set this and framed this within the issue of, of wider healthcare and, and discrimination within healthcare on a wider, whether it's a gender-based discrimination or an economic uh, issue. Uh, and because I think th this, ha th this, this can be a proxy for all the problems that are there. And, and I think, I mean, one of the things we get now is, oh, you know, that shortage you've done with abortion, now you're going on and banging on about it again. Whereas in reality, we, this is just a, a red flag marker of many, many other problems in our health service. And I think we can use it and lead out on that and frame it like that and provide other evidence to support it like that. And, and I think we need to, to, go, to go back campaigning about it again, because, you know, as in, inevitably in all aspects of healthcare, if you're well educated, computer literate and have money, there's really very little that you, you can't achieve. Uh, but if you have none of those, you, you are, are the most vulnerable. And that applies to all of the health services. And, and we, we do a lot of women and, and in patients in general a service, I think, if we went at that. Um, I do see we have one more question from the floor, which I will let go if it's going to be a very quick one, Emmeline. Sorry, because I'm conscious of everyone's time and I've held them all already. Yeah, I understand. Oops. Yeah, I understand. Sorry. I, um, I just wanted to ask Mara, uh, you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you had an estimation of 800 people still having to travel after legalization. How did you come up to that number? Sorry if it's a bit technical. 
did you catch that Mara that was um the question sorry your sound went down a little bit Emily and the, you had the estimation sorry. of uh I, I think it was 800 people or however many would still have to travel how did you get to that number oh sorry and I need to unmute uh we estimated six to eight hundred and we did that in conjunction with the abortion clinics in the UK based on how many people in general presented at UK clinics over 12 weeks. All right, thank you. <clears throat> or, you know, I just made it up, either. No, we don't, that's not how data works. <laughs> just make things up. We didn't do all this work to just make things up at the end. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to call it there because I'm conscious that I've taken everyone's time, uh, but I don't regret it even slightly. Uh, so it is time to wrap up. Thank you again, everyone, for coming today. Thank you to our speakers. And again, my particular thanks to everyone who shared their experiences as part of this research project. If you are in, as enraged as I am by what you have heard today, then please join us for the 10th annual March for Choice this Saturday. We're assembling at 2 p.m. at Dole Aaron for a socially distanced demonstration with some more amazing speakers. We're really trying to focus on those people who have been marginalized and who have been let down by our health system. So it should be a really great day. If you are unable to march in person, then please do contact your TDs and senators, including the ones who are on this call, to let them know your thoughts ahead of the upcoming legislative review. We do have some information on how to do this on our website. And the full research report is available at abortionrightscampaign.ie slash research. Um, that's it. I'm, I'm going to close this. Thank you so much to our amazing speakers. Thank you, Maraid. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Shelley and Sarah, um, our amazing ISL people. And you and thank you, Mary, for the technical support and, and goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. Watching everyone slowly leave. <laughs>